Dear ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to um, thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, moderate this e-poster session uh, on prostate cancer together with Dr. Wasdev. Uh, this uh, session includes 12 posters, um, which uh, you can access through the platform. The authors uh, have presented them. Uh, I will start with the first poster on selection of patients with intermediate risk prostate cancer for active surveillance and the question if MRI has a role in, in selecting these patients. To this aim, the authors looked at more than 1,000 patients with favorable intermediate risk disease. And uh, all these patients had an MRI available and the authors were able to show that patients with a positive MRI are more than twice as likely to have adverse pathology at radical prostatectomy, uh, which is a very significant result and um, uh, shows us that an identifiable lesion on MRI should prompt us to more carefully uh, look at these patients and decide if uh, they are good candidates for active surveillance um, or not. Coming to the second poster. Uh, this is uh, a, a multicentric analysis uh, among three centers from good and colleagues on cost effectiveness and prompts uh, comparison between laparoscopic and robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. 439 patients uh, were looked at. And uh, what the uh, authors found is, uh, and this is uh, in line with uh, previous studies, that uh, functional uh, outcomes seem to be better in the uh, robotic approach while uh, as expected, the laparoscopic approach was more cost effective. Um, however, it's always difficult to com uh, compare different uh, surgery types because you also have to take into consideration um, other aspects than just the uh, surgery type such as uh, the surgeons um, involved. Coming to the uh, third poster. Uh, this uh, is from Tamhan Kar and colleagues and uh, deals with the learning curve for robot assisted prostatectomy. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. In uh, previous studies, it has been shown that uh, the learning curve is um, the uh, that the learning for the open approach takes much longer than for the robotic approach. But uh, this study uh, deals with the learning curve for the robotic approach and uh, gives an estimate of numbers necessary to, um, uh, yeah, to overcome the learning curve. Uh, the authors um, report that about 300 cases and nearly four years uh, are needed for standardizing the um, operative and console time with an approximate estimation of requirement of around 80 cases per year for a single surgical team in the initial years for optimizing the uh, outcomes of the robotic approach. Um, the authors not only only looked at intraoperative parameters, but also at uh, postoperative parameters such as length of stay, complication rates, and uh, surgical margins. Um, so uh, they uh, conclude um, that uh, the robotic surgery is a um, safe procedure without any major uh, alteration and complication rates even uh, within the uh, learning curve. Coming to the next posters. So uh, the next three posters uh, will um, have the same uh, database. So uh, I will show them together. They are from 
uh, John and colleagues and all uh, work with the uh, national database of the um, British Association of Urological Surgeons, which includes almost 20,000 radical prostatectomies, which have been uh, performed between 2016 and 2018. So uh, this uh, first of those three posters deals with uh, a radical prostatectomy for Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer. And the question, who are these patients uh, and why are they uh, operated on? The authors show that um, more than half of the patients, 52%, uh, have uh, indications that ha they have uh, higher risk disease. Uh, because they have a PSA of 10 or above and a clinical stage of 2B or higher. Also, um, the authors uh, show that uh, reasons uh, for these patients to be operated are also patient preference, uh, high disease volume, and as uh, mentioned, uh, MRI suggesting a higher grade lesion um, and also uh, possibly um, extracapsular extension. So uh, there are still uh, patients uh, with Gleason 3 plus 3 who uh, don't receive active surveillance but surgery, but most of the time um, there's a reason for that. Coming uh, to the next poster, and uh, this one is also from the same uh, group of authors, basically showing the utility of the um, uh, British Association of Urological Surgeons um, database, uh, which um, shows radical prostatectomy practice across England. The um, authors highlight the completeness of the data set, 91% of radical prostatectomies are recorded in the data set. And um, more than 80% of the radical prostatectomies done are done in high volume centers. High volume centers uh, in this setting are defined as um, centers performing more than 100 uh, cases uh, per year. Also, uh, the authors highlight that 84% of patients had uh, Gleason 7 or higher disease. Um, we saw that in the last poster that it's uh, only a small amount of Gleason 6 patients receiving radical prostatectomy. And uh, at last that lymph node dissection is uh, more commonly um, performed in higher risk um, tumors. So uh, taken together, uh, these uh, results are in line with also other databases uh, showing uh, similar results and showing a similar decrease of uh, patients with low risk disease in a radical prostatectomy cohort. Coming uh, to the last poster, uh, this is uh, uh, very interesting because uh, we see in many countries that the proportion of uh, robotic surgery and robotic prostatectomies is really increasing. So uh, this poster uh, highlights uh, uh, the number uh, of open medical prostatectomies in the era of centralization and the robot. Um, it's again the uh, national database of the British Association of Urological Surgeons. Uh, it uh, shows that 1,692 open radical prostatectomies uh, were uh, performed within the total of almost 20,000 radical prostatectomies. So it's really uh, a small proportion of patients who receive open radical prostatectomy. Um, the authors also highlight that uh, the total surgeon number performing open radical prostatectomy was uh, 69, so quite high. But uh, the uh, number uh, with average annual cases of 15 or more was uh, only 13. 
So um, uh, also uh, this poster looks at uh, reasons why open radical prostatectomy was performed in the patients and specific uh, indications include the up, uh, prior abdominal pelvic surgery, contraindications to Trendelenburg positioning and uh, unforeseen robotic equipment failure uh, among other um, reasons. Uh, the comparison of open and robotic uh, surgery is still also an important topic to mention here, uh, despite the fact that uh, a randomized trial in this setting does exist, but uh, uh, it is, the limitation is uh, mainly that only two surgeons were included in this randomized trial, so it is still unclear if one of the approaches has a better um, outcome. We have uh, published a study on open versus robotic surgery uh, last year and looked at 10,000 patients uh, operated on by high volume surgeons only. And in this setting, uh, there are um, no differences in functional outcomes. Despite this, uh, not every country such as it happened in the USA or England uh, does do the robotic approach in such a high proportion. For example, in Germany, there's still a lot of surgery performed with the open approach and mainly uh, the reason is uh, uh, reimbursement issues. So uh, this was it for the first uh, half of this uh, session. And um, I'm uh, happy to introduce Dr. Vastev, he, who will uh, talk about posters 7 to 12. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Nikhil Vastev, and I'm a consultant urologist at the Lister Hospital at Stevenage. And I'll be talking from poster 7 up to poster 12 in the optimization of uh, treatment for prostate cancer. So the first poster that I'll be discussing is poster 7, which is restia sparing technique, which leads to improved early continence recovery and better quality of uh, life after robotic prostatectomy, which is a multi-center series of over 400 patients. The author of uh, this particular abstract is Stan W from um, UCH and the other institutions affiliated with the abstract are from Royal Surrey and Royal Marston. This, this interesting abstract covers the quality of life, erectile function and urinary function of patients treated with the Retsius sparing robotic radical prostatectomy approach in comparison to the non Retsius sparing robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy approach. And the follow-up data is available for nine months. The duration of the data being captured in this abstract is from August 2017 to July 2019. And a total of 413 patients have been included in this abstract, which includes 240 patients who had the non retsia spare robotic prostatectomy versus 173 who had a robotic uh, retsia sparing prostatectomy. The follow-up data indicates that the positive surgical margin shows no difference. So the retsia sparing positive margin rates were 21.4%, whereas the non retsia sparing positive margin was 17.1%. The retsia sparing patients improved recording in the EDSD 3 uh, l scores at seven days, but no difference was noted at one month, three months, six months, and nine months of follow-up. So there was also no difference noted in the IIE5 scores or in the low-yield tract symptom scores. So in conclusion, the abstract confirms that the immediate quality of life and urinary function, including continence recovery, is optimistic in the retsia sparing approach. Obviously, we need longer data to come through, but it's an interesting abstract because it highlights the fact that certain centers which are offering the retsia sparing approach are noticing not only improvement in the early phase of recovery following robotic prostatectomy, but more importantly, even oncologically, both the techniques, which is retsia sparing versus non-retsia sparing, do match from the oncological outcome based on the positive surgical margin data, which has been put forward. The next abstract is exercise-induced uh, attenuation of treatment side effects in newly diagnosed prostate cancer patients who are beginning androgen deprivation therapy on the basis of a randomized controlled trial. The lead author for this abstract is uh, Najibar W from uh, the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital. 
The other institutions and authors affiliated are from Northumbria University, the James Cook University in Australia, and the University of East Anglia. This abstract sets out to evaluate if exercise attenuates the adverse effects of androgen deprivation therapy in prostate cancer patients, and also to examine whether exercise-induced improvements are sustained when withdrawal of supervised exercise treatment regimens take place. It's a fairly matched cohort, which has been compared 50 patients in total, who, of whom all of these patients are on androgen deprivation treatment, and 24 patients were randomized to the exercise group versus 26 patients were randomized to the control group. The exercise group obviously went through extensive exercise regimens, which include aerobic and resistant exercises on a twice weekly basis for 60 minutes, followed by three months of self-directed exercise. Secondary outcomes have also been measured in this particular abstract. The results at three months are very interesting. It shows that exercise training prevented adverse changes in certain parameters such as peak O2, ventilatory threshold, O2 uptake, and fatigue scores. After the exercise regimen was withdrawn, the difference in cardiopulmonary fitness and fatigue were not sustained. This abstract concluded that a short-term program of supervised exercise with prostate cancer beginning uh, with patients who start off with antigen deprivation therapy will result in quality of life and cardiovascular events risk profile to be improved. And this is an interesting abstract once again, because the question comes up is whether there should be a drive now nationally to implement uh, exercise regimen in patients who are starting off antigen deprivation therapy, because in the context of cardiovascular side effects in the long term, which have been propagated with antigen deprivation therapy, whether exercise itself could neutralize the risk. So really interesting abstract and even the nice gap analysis does question whether an exercise program does run in certain centers. So probably this might be the standard of care in the next few years. The next abstract, which is abstract nine, is does big mean bad? The correlation between prostate cancer tumor volume and oncological outcomes. The lead presenter for this is N. Rayson from Imperial College NHS Trust. And we also have other authors from the same organization, which is Imperial College London. In this abstract, the author set out to examine whether tumor volume can predict oncological outcomes following radical prostatectomy. This particular abstract captures the data of 465 patients who underwent a minimally invasive prostatectomy from a multi-surgeon database at the institution. The data analysis which was conducted was a univariate analysis of association between tumor volume and biochemical reference in metastasis, which was performed using the independent t-test. Data showed a statistically significant difference when it came to tumor volume both with or without biochemical reference in metastasis. The need for adjuvant treatment was based on tumor volume size, which was now confirmed in this abstract to be about 4.86 millimeters. In conclusion, this abstract confirms that tumor volume is an independent marker for disease severity. And this brings up a few discussions, which would include whether biochemical recurrence was not only related to the positive surgical margin status, of these patients who had minimally invasive surgery that obviously will come through. But whether now in the context of a lot of patients having preoperative MRIs, whether preoperative MRIs itself could be used as a tool to predict the risk of biochemical reference or, neo -adju or, or the need for adjuvant therapy in the context of patients undergoing minimally invasive surgery. So a very, very useful abstract in the current context of uh, surgery taking place for prostate cancer patients. Poster 10 is prostate cancer quality of life following surgery and insight into outcomes from a range of secondary treatments. The lead author and presenter for this is D. Good from Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. And the other affiliations of the authors are from the Department of Oncology in the same hospital in Edinburgh itself. The aim of the abstract is to assess whether patient reported outcomes, that's PROMS, following secondary treatments for prostate cancer, be it in the context of artificial urinary sphincters or salvaged radiotherapy are accurately being recorded and reported. The authors set out to evaluate two databases, first preoperatively and one year post-surgery, and also they followed this up with a postal prom questionnaire for patients who underwent an artificial urinary sphincter or salvaged radiotherapy from 2011 to 2018. The data captured 
included a total of 429 patients, amongst which 45 patients had artificial urinary sphincters and 47 patients had salvage radiotherapy. Patients in the artificial urinary sphincter group had the lowest PROM outcomes. However, there was no clinical difference in the incontinence between the artificial urinary sphincter group and the post LRP group. The continence prompts for patients receiving salvage radiotherapies were good, and there was no statistical difference between this group and the post LRP group again. There was a significant and clinically lower bowel quality of life reported. So, in conclusion, this abstract suggests that patients requiring secondary treatments following surgery for prostate cancer do not suffer worse, out, worse incontinence from the quality of life's point of view, however, do have significant higher uh, decision regret and the lower quality of life, be it from the perspective of bowel symptoms or obstructive symptoms in comparison to um, secondary treatments is, is not seen. So the discussion with this particular abstract is the importance to counsel patients who have secondary treatments and or actually managing uh, patient expectations. So again, great data, which, which falls into place in, in the clinical context of managing patients who are having secondary treatments be in the context of sphincters or a salvage radiotherapy. Poster 11 is late gen genital urinary toxicity following curative intent, intensity modulated radiotherapy for prostate cancer, which is a systematic review. The lead author for this is R, David R from um, Australia and a few more centers in Australia from Adelaide have been affiliated with this abstract. The aim of this abstract is to assess the incidence of rate genital urinary toxicity following curative intent, intensity IMRT in patients with localized prostate cancer. The authors conduct a systematic literature search using Medline, Embase and Cochrane from January 2008 to January 2019, following the FASMA guidelines. Five studies have been included with a total of 4,671 patients. Amongst this cohort, 1,001 patients were identified and the side effect profile was reported based on the radiation therapy oncologically group, which is the RTOG grade more than two with a cumulative incidence of 19% uh, at 60 months, and 53 pay, uh, National Cancer Institute common terminology criteria for adverse events of more than grade two complications were identified, which included 33%, and 4% of patients had hematuria, 10% of patients had urinary incontinence, and 24% of patients had symptoms suggestive of retention. So in conclusion, this abstract confirms that the late genital urinary toxicity following IMRT is common at 60 months. And urologists are likely to see a growing burden of these patients come through our practice. And the discussion is that probably joint management of patients is better, but it's also important for the radiation oncologists who do deliver IMRT to counsel patients on both the immediate and long-term side effects and probably jointly managing these patients together may be beneficial in the long term. But we need to um, evaluate and see what you, local data in the UK suggests. But it's very interesting to see that at 60 months, a, a lot of patients do have uh, side effects from, from their treatment. Poster 12 is the importance of lymph node location, burden, and, and treatment outcomes in metastatic, that's M1, hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, which is analysis from Stampy Trial Arms ANC. The lead author of this is A.I. Hanlan from the Christie and Salford NHS Trust in Manchester. And this abstract has been led, read by Professor Noel Clark and Professor James. The author set out to evaluate the current metastatic burden definitions, uh, which set the criteria for treatment in patients who have lymph node metastatic disease. The authors look at metastasis directed therapy and the choice of therapy, which does vary widely at the moment. And the data has been captured from two arms of the Stampede clinical trial, arm A and arm C. Arm A is obviously standard of care, which is androgen deprivation treatment with radiotherapy, uh, plus or minus docetaxel, plus or minus abiraterone treatment, which is the control arm of the Stampede trial, and arm C, which is androgen deprivation therapy, docetaxel and prednisolone, which at the moment is no longer recruiting. The data has been captured on 1,086 patients, 
who are in arm A and arm C between October 2005 and March 2013. It was found that using Royal College of Radiology lymph node diagnostic criteria on both CT and MRI imaging, the scans which were performed by, were reviewed by two experienced uh, readers. The lymph node number and size were in the region of the operator, external iliac, internal iliac, and sacral lymph nodes. And the authors also evaluated non-regional non metastatic disease in the common iliac, retroperitoneal, and mediastinal areas. What the authors found was the lymph node metastatic distribution was evaluated in about 629 patients, of whom 307 had enlarged lymph nodes. 178 patients had non-regional lymph node enlargement. Following the regional assessment, the operator lymph node was the commonest uh, lymph node identified in 203 men, followed by the internal iliac and the external iliac lymph nodes. So this data again highlights the fact that the stampede treatment outcome will refine uh, the existing metastatic burden criteria and the impact of stratification of lymph node metastatic disease is not only important in the context of patients who have uh, metastatic disease in the stampede trial, but also in the context of local or locally advanced disease to stratify the importance of evaluating lymph node metastasis in detail. Thank you very much.